Live from SABC Studios in Auckland Park, Johannesburg. Welcome to this midweek edition of The Watchdog. My name is Vuyam Voko and on the show tonight... In less than 20... This is the nation on the government's priorities for 2023. Over the past couple of days here on the program, we spoke to some of the country's foremost political analysts and economists. And tonight we hear from organizations representing a broad spectrum of civil society, including trade unions and non-governmental organizations. How do they feel about the country right now? How, what do they think the president should focus on tomorrow? We'll also bring you an update on a double tragedy that has hit the province of the Eastern Cape. One, a pileup involving at least 13 cars outside Kone and East London, as well as floods in Komani. The watchdog starts now. As preparations continue ahead of tomorrow's State of the Nation address, National Assembly Speaker Nosviwe Mapisa Ngagula has explained to the media about the rules that would need to be followed during proceedings. This, of course, on the back uh, of uh, threats uh, by some political parties that they will be protesting ahead of the President's State of the Nation address. I do not want to entertain this notion of people who are threatening to disrupt the State of the Nation Address. The State of the Nation Address will proceed, and I can assure you it will be successful. However, we just need to have an understanding amongst one another that we are adults and that we are serving the people of South Africa and that whatever we do inside this house, the people of South Africa as voters who put us here are watching. So we've got to be patient with one another. There has to be mutual respect for one another and we have to listen to one another. So I don't think that Emma Sondo has sleepless nights. I don't have sleepless nights. Obviously, you worry every now and then because people have surprises. I hope you will also not surprise us. The country's workers meanwhile are battling to cope. This as the economy struggles to emerge from a recession and debt levels are rising. With the unemployment rate sitting at 43%, workers believe the situation is set to deteriorate further unless President Cyril Ramaphosa tomorrow presents a clear program and sets clear implementation benchmarks as well as time frames. My first guests are Matthew Park from the Congress of South African Trade Unions, Kosatu, and uh, joining me in studio is Trevor Shaku from the South African Federation of Trade Unions, SAFTA. Good evening to both of you gentlemen. Thanks very much for your time. Good evening and thanks for having us. Let me start uh, with you, Trevor, I mean, if I may. I'm a general, everyone we've been speaking to, you know, uh, over the past week especially, doesn't seem to be particularly optimistic about um, tomorrow's uh, State of the Nation address. Are you as well? We, we also are not uh, optimistic about tomorrow. Uh, in fact, we have lost confidence in the ability of the governing, uh, uh, the ruling government, uh, the ruling party in particular, uh, ability to tackle the many issues which our people are faced with. For instance, uh, you've just quoted the levels of unemployment, which have risen over the years to more than 40% using the expanded definition. This is a catastrophe, especially in the context of the rising cost of living. It means that people who are losing employment are also mm -hmm. losing a form of income. Mm -hmm. Now, in addition to this, we think that the problem lies with the capitalist government, the neoliberal policies which government, the ANC government, 
it's champ building and uh, you would also see throughout because in the context of a system which is predicated on production of commodities one has to have money in order to access certain goods and services mm -hmm. and if you have no employment no form of income it means that you will not be able to afford and provide for your family mm -hmm. now in that instance a government ought to intervene through its fiscal powers to mm -hmm. ensure that it's spent in social security in social wage to make sure that education healthcare are accessible but also of quality mm -hmm. and secondly also that uh, there are social security measures which are put in place to ensure that those who are unemployed and marginalized in the economy are able mm -hmm. to afford a living mm -hmm. of course i mean matthew parks uh, everyone has been talking about the energy crisis and uh, of course the role of escom within all of that um your statement calls for uh, resources um to to be given to escom and the authority um, to to reduce load shedding, ramp up targeted high impact maintenance, bring on board new generation capacity, um, slash ASCOM. I mean, these are things that everyone has been talking about and which up until now have not happened. So I'm saying, uh, 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 what gives you any hope or optimism that, you know, the president will will address those tomorrow if that hasn't happened and the crisis has instead, uh, I mean, the situation has deteriorated further. Yeah. So, I mean, good evening for you. I, I, I don't think we have a choice. Um, we can we can easily, you know, like any other human being, mm. um, engage in self-pity, engage in despair, just lose hope. And that's a natural human tendency. Mm -hmm. But I think when we have workers' jobs on the line, when we have the, fa the, the fate of the state, the entire nation's achievements since 1994, we don't have the luxury to simply say, well, let's fold up our arms and give up. Uh, we have a huge amount of crisis, not just the issue of electricity, but also unemployment, of corruption, of a stagnant economy, of the devastation uh, wrecked upon our, our freight rail, our passenger railway network, and many other SOEs. We've got to deal with it. Um, we have no choice. If we don't deal with it, then voters will judge all of us, including the ruling party, very harshly in the next election. That will be the democratic a right to do so in a democracy. Mm. We've been engaged with the president and we said, look, we think it's now time for us to, to declare a state of disaster uh, for three reasons. One reason to give the public a sense of confidence that the government is taking this matter seriously, is putting in place the necessary interventions. There are clear time frames upon which society can hold the state accountable. We think it's also critical in terms of government itself to take this matter seriously. That is not just the issue of a crisis for ESCOM or public enterprises to sort out, mm. but all organs of the state, be it tragedy on the debt relief front, be the law enforcement agencies in terms of eradicating the, the cans of corruption at all levels of ESCOM, mm -hmm. be it local government, making sure that they themselves reduce the debt of 56 billion rand the municipalities of ESCOM, that all of them play a, a contribution towards ESCOM. But I think also to say to society at large, we have to have a partnership between the state, between ESCOM, between society at large, even businesses to all contribute towards resolving our energy crisis. Mm -hmm. I think for us, what is a critical measure or role model to say, is it how I manage COVID-19 collectively as a society? Yes, the president led us. Yes, government had to do many of the, the critical interventions, but there was also a role for the ordinary taxi driver, for the nurse, for the businessman, for the shopkeeper, for the churches. Everybody had to play a role, including for trade unions. Mm. I think that's the only way we managed to manage COVID-19 against all odds. We didn't treat it like a health department responsibility, but we took collective ownership. That's how we're going to resolve our energy crisis, our unemployment crisis, or freight rail crisis or crisis of corruption, etc. Mm -hmm. Because the problems are too large for government its own to resolve. They will never have enough money. Business cannot resolve them because they don't have the political power. Trading themselves, we cannot resolve them on our own. So it requires all of us to, to make a contribution. And I know times are very difficult and workers are very disappointed and frustrated and demoralized, and correctly so. But we have been able to see some green shoots. Last year, we managed to see the economy getting out of a recession, unemployment falling by 1% for each of the last three quarters, so by 3%, it's still a crisis. You can't sustain a, a nation with 43% unemployment. We have been, begun to see some progress in the fight against corruption. We've seen the South African Revenue Service being rebuilt, collecting additional generation of revenue to the state, which can help the state be rebuilt. We saw today one person in the Eastern Cape being sentenced to, I think, for the 10 years in prison, something like that, for about, uh, I think, 20 million rand worth of corruption for the PPEs in one Department of Health in the Eastern Cape. So that's some progress. But again, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to see tomorrow the president really saying, 
government gets the crisis, it's got a plan, and here's how we're going to make, work together as a society to resolve our crisis. Now, Trevor, I mean, your, your federation believes that, or says the most common corrupt practices when service providers or tenderpreneurs um, inflate quotations during procurement. But uh, ESCOM has gone beyond that to talk about debt to call that people bring. They talk about uh, uh, um, uh, people who are stealing um, from uh, from the from 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 power stations, hence they have brought in the South African National um, Defence Force. Um, they also um, talk about uh, uh, sabotage as well. Yes, the you see the corruption in the country, uh, especially in the ANC, the ruling party, is entrenched and festered, and as a result, is spilling into society. You do not go into communities or communities today and uh, believe that you would go through uh, tendering to offer a particular service for a community without having to pay kickbacks. And as a result, this is how corruption is spilling into our communities. But of course, there are those bigger syndicates who, for instance, have been uh, responsible for the so-called sabotage at the, at, the, at the state utility, the power utility ESCO. But you see, these things are not isolated, in my view, because the people who are participating in this or who are party to this corruption, uh, first of all, are those in government, the government officials who benefit from kickbacks, but also those even in the private sector who are benefiting from these uh, 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 tenders which are awarded to them without following due processes. Now, the problem with that is that at the, in the first end, it is our people who are suffering because these are people who are supposed to, to pay services for our people. These are people who are supposed to ensure that uh, potholes are filled uh, and closed, that uh, asbestos roofs are removed, mm. and many other things which are, are required for government to be able to fulfill, which has not been coming to party, first as a result of the austerity, mm. but secondly as a result of corruption. And this, in our view, uh, uh, ought to be dealt with. Without having to deal with this, you are not going to fix it. But we also raise a point that if you fix the issues around corruption mm -hmm. without having to deal with the budget cuts which have been carried brutally by the ANC government, especially in the recent period, you are not going to achieve anything. I mean, austerity even require a very brilliant and the most qualified, competent manager would not be able to turn around an SOE or even a financial, so a, 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 a state institution, for instance, like a school or a particular uh, a, a hospital, because of that. So what, what austerity has done over the years, uh, uh, intermingling, of course, with corruption to collapse the whole of the public sector, is that you have understaffing, which continues to uh, 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 characterize most of our hospitals as a result of the headcount reduction, which is caused by the cuts which are implemented by Treasury. But secondly, you're also having problems in relation to equipment and infrastructure. We have infrastructure backlog, not only in the health mm -hmm. sector, but also across the state institution, the, 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 the institutions which are responsible for delivering mm -hmm. the public service to our people, of which 80%, more than 80% is dependent on them. Mm -hmm. Now, for instance, look at the schools. A school at the current moment would not be able to have a proper working environment because work overload causes stress, distress, leading to absenteeism of teachers. But in addition to that, you have these people, I mean, the, 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 the National Education Infrastructure Management uh, published a report, the last report they published in April of 2021, showed that the, many of the schools, after 23,000 schools at a time, about 19,000 of them did not have natural science laboratories, did not have uh, 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 maths labs, did not have libraries, did not have even internet for administrative purposes in the uh, staff. How do you then even uh, expect that a school will be able to submit necessary information to the district for monitoring and all of that? If all of this is impeded by the austerity cuts which have been carried out brutally mm -hmm. by the ANC government. I was just saying, I mean, uh, on the back of what Trevor has just said, I mean, Matthew, um, you know, the morale, you know, the what has happened to um, the public service, certainly, obviously, from a uh, from where as workers you 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 sit. 
Interesting because in Kosato's statement, uh, you talk about, quote unquote, the South African government needs to fix its relationship with public servants. A state cannot be productive if nurses, doctors, police officers, and countless other hardworking public servants feel aggrieved that their employer is outsourcing the bill for state capture and corruption to them and pickpocketing their mega wages to balance the books. Yeah. So, so look, I mean, any employment or any workplace, be it public or private, depends upon workers. Um, workers provide the labor which uh, fuels those companies, or in this case, the state. Uh, we all praise the, the role of public servants during COVID-19 uh, when we were under lockdown, when people who could work from home or who couldn't go to work safely were at home safely from the pandemic. Yet it is nurses and doctors, other health workers, it was a frontline public service workers, police officers, defense force personnel, correctional services, traffic officers, municipal cleaners, who had to work, keep the nation safe. And if you look at some of the death rates for health workers, it was horrendous. Literally in the hundreds, in the first few days, health workers just simply died. Because you exposed doctors and nurses to huge levels of COVID-19. Mm. Simply we had a huge amount of municipal workers getting infected left, right and center. Yet at the same time, Public service are not asking for unreasonable demands. They're simply saying, can we earn a living wage? Can we take care of our families, can we pay off our debts? Workers, including public service workers, are supporting a huge army of relatives who are unemployed. On average, one worker will support about six or seven relatives. And this is more so an economy where we have a 43% unemployment rate. So it's wrong, you know, at times for people in business or even in parliament to say, well, workers are tight or they're not. They're keeping this nation afloat. We also forget often that as workers' pension funds, public and private, which are invested throughout the state, in government bonds, throughout the private sector, listed companies. So I think for us, if you want to get the state rebuilding and rebuilt, and all of us, be it in the private sector or ordinary citizens, we all depend upon a well-functioning state, be it quality schools. So we need to make sure we reduce the size of the classroom in the public school, make sure there are decent toilets for teachers, for learners that, live, that uh, girls at schools are safe. We need to make sure our police officers have working vehicles the sufficient personnel deployed. Mm -hmm. We've seen a shrink in the, uh, the police service headcount from 208,000 during the World Cup to 172,000 to date. Of course, it's now begun to increase a bit because of our engagement with government. That's a positive mm -hmm. trend. Mm -hmm. But we've seen doctors having to work 48 hour shifts, nurses having to fill one or two empty posts. So again, we have to rebuild, we have to fill these vacancies. Mm -hmm. Now people will say, well, look, government is over, overfed. It's not true. <laughs> in fact, in fact, Trevor, I mean, what uh, uh, the very last point that Matthew just made is one of the reasons the government is putting forward um, for not be, uh, uh, as being one of the key reasons why it simply cannot f afford what the workers are asking for. Because on the one hand, you need more police, you need more nurses, so that money has to come from somewhere. Secondly, I mean, there's a huge debt that we have to service um, as, as, as a nation. That money would also have to come from somewhere. Um, the unfortunate part is that the neoliberals dominate. And what they've done is to uh, make the rest of the public believe that the so-called debt deficits, uh, the debt to GDP ratio, this scaremongering uh, concepts and phraseologies are in any way having any serious uh, uh, factor on the ability of the government to be able to spend. Mm -hmm. Now, we must dispel these myths. First of all, even using their very methods of looking at the debt to GDP ratio. Mm -hmm. If you look at the levels of debt to GDP ratio and look at South Africa uh, in the world ranking, it is about number 70, uh, a country which in our view relatively does not have much of debt to GDP ratio. Mm -hmm. A lot of those countries are operating with debt to GDP ratios of over 100%. In fact, uh, Japan even operates with a debt to GDP ratio of 240, United States of 140 something. Now, all of these are doing it because it is necessary to spend. But secondly, let me answer where would this money come from? Of course, we have proposed that the rich must be taxed. You can't continue to subsidize the rich at a time when they are actually making this money, accumulating this money and holding it in their banks. Actually, it's not even holding, it's holding only in the literal sense. But in actual things, 
it is holding for accumulation because they hold this, they, they accumulate, take it, peg it into the, uh, uh, into the uh, uh, bank accounts where it will accumulate through savings, interest rates and all of that. This is the first part. So you are going to have to embark on a radical taxation mm -hmm. which would ensure that there is a distribution mm -hmm. of, 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 of this income mm -hmm. to the people a majority, 80% of whom mm. actually are sharing the spoils mm. of the economy at 20%, according to the World Bank report. This is the first part. But we also are saying that government does not depend on tax only to be able to spend. It spends money into creation. Mm. And you can see this if you trace the history of the country and how money is created. Mm. So why, shouldn't, why are they not using their money creating uh, abilities to be able to spend into certain uh, 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 public institutions, for instance, education, mm. health, and all of that. I in all of these things, you need first and foremost to increase the wages of workers because the rising cost of living makes it unaffordable and worse for those households. But at the same time, you need the headcount to increase in the public service mm. so that our hospitals, clinics will continue to have enough workers mm. working there. But also, you are able to even expand. Mm. You saw the, 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 the reports made by Sunday Times. We showed that the universities received in total about a, a, a total of more than 4 million applications for those who wanted to pursue further studies. Mm. And these uh, universities collectively, about 20 of them collectively only, had less than 200,000 uh, 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 spaces for this. So where would we think that the opportunities, the spaces for these young people mm. would be created, if not through expenditure? Mm. We cannot be buying into the neoliberal fiscal and monetary policies of these people. Now, a lot of these uh, uh, debates, uh, Matthew, are supposed or were supposed to or supposed to be taking place at, at Nedlec. That's where business, um, labor, civil society and the government uh, meet. Um, and uh, it, the last State of the Nation address, the president promised um, that uh, there would be discussions at NEDLEC. He gave that process 100 days uh, within which to arrive at a social compact. And that social compact was going to um, arrive ultimately at how we're going to get out of the uh, economic situation we are in come up with an economic recovery plan and address some of the issues we've just only, in fact, barely scratched the surface uh, um, of, I mean, right now in the little time that we've had. Um, but that hasn't happened. A year after he made that, those pronouncements, he's going to this State of the Nation address um, tomorrow, not having met those deadlines, and nothing seems to have come out of um, that, that prov uh, 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 a promise. In a nutshell, what actually happened? Why um, was, were those deadlines not met? And uh, do we have any hope that that process can or will even be resurrected, so to speak? So, so I don't think it's completely true that that happened or hasn't been completely met. Um, I think, look, with this is sort of the basics. I think first we support a social company as labor because Governors own will never have enough money. Business own doesn't have the legislative powers. So of course, trade unions, we, we, we struggle on both fronts. But all of us can make a contribution, and we need to contribute towards common solution because we're all in the same boat together, irrespective of our political differences. Mm. But there are social compacts, and I'll point to governors that one is that a social compact has to be based on progressive principles, protecting workers' rights, giving meaningful relief to the poor, growing the economy, rebuilding the state, mm. and so forth. We don't need new economic plans. We have the Economic Recovery and Reconstruction Plan, which is a social comic that was agreed to the year before, is signed and adopted and the table of parliament in October 2020. And there has been some progress in implementing it, for example, reducing the unemployment rate by 3% last year, the rebuilding of SARS and so forth. But there's many, many other areas which have not had sufficient speed on it, including business honoring its own commitments to it. Mm. So I think it is a bit unrealistic um, to say we're going to come up with a new social comic within 100 days. We, our approach has been as Corsage to say, look, we don't need a plethora of plans. Let's simply take out of the economic recovery plan. Mm -hmm. What are the two or three big issues we can fix in this month or this quarter? Let's fix them. Let's give society a bit of confidence. Let's give a little bit of momentum. Because if we're going to come with a plan every single year, a social compact every single year, society will not take us seriously. Mm -hmm. We have the ESCOM social compact. We've begun to see 
Um, corruption being tackled at ESCOM, we managed to recover about 5 billion rand at ESCOM. We managed to reduce the regulatory blockages to get generation on board. But we need to see much more being done. We've got the 20 industrial master plans covering all the key sectors of the economy. Those are social compacts between government, business and labor. Eight of them have been adopted, are being implemented. We're now beginning to see some green shoots around the clothing and textile industries, around the poultry, the sugar, the motor manufacturing industries. But many more need to see much more injection um, it, you know, interventions by them, by government, by business, and so forth. These include mining, renewable energy, health, and pharmaceuticals, and so on. But I think for us, what's critical really is not having a beautiful plan or nice English words about saying what can we do, what can be done quickly, medium term, longer term, but that all of us can can get things done. So we have met with the president and with government to say what we, do we think are the issues that need to be included in the state of the nation address, the budget. I think for us, it's the critical of the foundations for addressing the economic crisis. That's the energy shortage. It's a devastation to our freight and our passenger rail. It's the issue of corruption. It's the issue of bringing on board new revenue to the state so we can fund the public services. Mm. It's about expanding the presidential promise stimulus to mm. incorporate at least a million, if not two million, young unemployed persons. Mm. It's about extending the SRD grant to give some sort of relief to those who are unemployed. Mm. Can we increase the food poverty line? Mm. Can we ensure its participants are given skills, training, and employment opportunities too? Equally, the private sector has to come to the party. Mm. We cannot have a situation where the CEO of a mining company gets paid 3 million rand a year, yet wants to cobble mine workers for a 150 rand increase. Mm. We need to see the private sector, the banks, the mining companies, the retail sector saying, what can they do to ram up local procurement, to create jobs, to invest in local industries, mm. and so forth? Because government can do so much, the private sector too needs to come to the party. Uh, uh, the good thing, I mean, the economists tell us, um, uh, Trevor, uh, is that um, it then affords every everyone um, an opportunity to say uh, this is what we want and others to argue whether it's realistic or not but also to commit to uh, to say to say uh, this is what we're going to forgo in the interest of growing the economy this is what we also prepared to forgo in the interest of creating um, um, more jobs now you have just been accepted is that the right word mm. uh, <laughs> you are now going to be or are part of of Netflix. what will we be putting on the on the table and I have run out of time uh, of course we will be championing uh, the issues of workers uh, the socio-economic interests of workers that is the purpose of any federation to ensure that the limitation which trade unions are met with which is to go forward and campaign for socio-economic interests we're able to do that but i want to pick up two things quickly the first one is that the in the social compacts we must always understand that the capitalists will never make any compromise that does not assure them yeah but that's the whole point of, of of the arrangement it is so that uh you know uh Everyone, whoever is unreasonable gets exposed and people get to accept that compromises will have to be made. But, Isn't that the whole you know, point? No, no, no. In my view, this uh, net like as a cooperative structure was actually invented to ensure that it lays the labor movement into sleep to a certain extent, make concessions begin to understand certain things uh, which it shouldn't even be. Why would you be want to be part of that then? We want to be <laughs> part of that so that we expose its limitations. Because if you look at this, one, you have the organization, uh, COSAT, which Matthew is representing, which we, in our view is compromised by its relationship with the, with the governing party. But secondly, you have other trade, uh, trade union federations which accept the model of neoliberal framework. And in our view, these are two uh, uh, compromising positions for these federations. Mm -hmm. We come as a radical alternative to fight for the space of workers and ensure that we expose to the fullest uh, 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 the, the limitations of that structure. Of course, we are going to interrogate these issues further <laughs> once we hear uh, tomorrow evening what the president has to say and of course the implications for all of us. But thanks to both of you for agreeing to come on this evening. Thank you very much. Trevor Shaku, Matthew Parks. After the break, we speak to civil society groupings that will be marching on Parliament tomorrow ahead of the President's State of the Nation address. What do they want?
Well, several civil society groupings will be marching on Parliament tomorrow ahead of the President's State of the Nation address. They include Cry of the Excluded, which comprises of several social movements and trade unions. Uh, Dominic is, belongs to that group. Rod Solomons is the convener of SA First Forum, an organization formed to empower South Africans to push back against accountability within government. Good evening to both of you gentlemen and thank you very much for your time. Hello. Let me start with you, Dominic. I mean, uh, if uh, I may, the, what it is that the message you want to send to the president, the government, but also the national legislature tomorrow um, when, you, when you march. Number one, we need a basic income grant of 1,500 rand implemented. And the budget speech um, on the 22nd of February should say that we will implement a net wealth tax and other taxes on the rich to finance it. There's a number of other important demands like job creation and also the needing to address the cost of living crisis um, that we're facing in this country. For you, Rod? No, no. Um, I think it's very simple. We, what we want is action, because uh, actions speak louder than words. The president is very good in making speeches. He will probably um, announce a number of plans, etc. But for me, it is simple. Actions speak louder than words, because the president, unfortunately, and his government has, get a, has got a credibility issue. Uh, ordinary South Africans no longer believe what he says or what they say. So um, it is action. And um, the, one, one of the key actions that I would be comfortable with is if he makes sure, if he ensure that he has a better team to deliver on what he's promised before and what he will be promising again tomorrow. Because it's no use you promise all of these things and then you have the same players it has been incompetent all of these years. Some of them have got allegations of corruption swirling over them, but he keeps them in his, in his cabinet. So it's simple. I would want, we would want action from the president, action to ensure that our people have a dignified life, action to make sure that there are practical steps to deal with the issues around electricity, the issues around our railways, the, the issues around our water, the issues around our sewage, all of that stuff. So we need practical action and we need to have people who are able to do that. Anything else for, for all what's worth, I don't need to listen to that president's speech. We want action. Do you, and, do you yes, believe he has an incompetent team right now? But without a doubt, he a team that can't even change a tire. If you leave one of them back in the road, they won't be able to change a tire. He's got an incompetent team that doesn't know what they need to do. There are good South Africans outside that is not in that cabinet and not in that government. And I think come 2024, we've got an opportunity to get competent South Africans in there. But while he's still the president of the country, he needs to look amongst those members who's in parliament. I think they've got over 200. See who are the competent ones. Who are the ones that can do things and not only the ones who are supporting him. So, no. uh, uh, the team who don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Okay, Dominic, uh, I mean, the, yes, uh, we've, uh, we've spoken about job creation among the program over the past um, few days. I mean, everyone is uh, pretty much on the, on the, on the same page. Or but one, the issue I want to pursue with you, just from what you've uh, just said, is the one of the basic income grants. Certainly from pronouncements that the uh, finance minister has been making over the past uh, few months before they said they weren't speaking about anything until the budget, um, it looked 
looked like they were they um, are warming up to to the idea and if uh, the ANC's own conference resolutions are anything to go by it would seem that um, uh, uh, everyone agrees that um, we perhaps need to move in that direction but the key question has been where the money is going to come from well, you, I would like to make three points, if I may. Um, the first point I'd like to touch on the real state of the nation. The second point I'd like to touch a little bit on what uh, Mr. Rob said. And then the third point I want to make is about where the money Dominic, comes it's from. Dominic, it's not Mr. Rob, it is Rob. It's fine. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I didn't... Rob, I didn't not Mr. To... Rob. Sorry, sorry, Rod. Okay, so, that's my okay. Apology. Mm. I didn't mean to offend you, I'm sorry. So point number one, Boyo, we are struggling to make ends meet, most South Africans. We are paying more for electricity and for food as we see a cost of living crisis. So there I agree with, with Rod. Because government increased the interest rate, we are also paying more for debt repayment costs. Those who are of us who are, are lucky enough to have jobs haven't received above inflation rate increases. Social grants also haven't increased by above inflation. Millions of us have been demanding that we need a basic income grant for some time and this government has been proposing it really since 1997 with a, a white paper on social protection. Mm -hmm. And it's been almost 25 years since, more than 25 years since then, and nothing has been done. And the big issue is the money question. And we need the big problem that's preventing us from spending the money needed, not only for the basic income grant, but for decent job creation, for improving public services is there. What's not there is the political will. Mm. Now, no. we can't make empty promises about all the things that should be done, because we know this government has not only made promises from the time of the presidency of President Ramaphosa. It's come along for much longer than then. Mm. And I don't think it's simply an issue of incompetence. Mm. And we don't think it's simply of an issue of incompetence. In fact, we think that there's some good people in government. The problem is that we have a treasury and a government in general, and most of the political parties who are advancing a neoliberal agenda that is saying that they're putting the interests of the private sector or big businesses and profits, the small elite, above the interests of the majority of people in this country. The more than 11 million people that's unemployed, the more, the more than half the population is basically dependent on some form of social grant. So where can we find the money? Okay. Now, so Rod, can I, can I, I, I quickly I, talk to this quick? No, quick, can, 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 can I interrupt quick. you there? Can I interrupt you there? Because uh, I think you did get an opportunity to um, read your state um, of the nation address um, in somewhat. You made uh, quite a number of, uh, of points. But here's what I want to ask Rod. Assuming, Rod, that uh, you agree to uh, perhaps a large extent um, with what uh, Dominic had to had to say there and you said at the beginning of your or oh, when you made your opening remarks um, that you need action more than anything else yeah. what do you think or how do you think the, the, pres the president should approach the issues um, that Dominic has just put before us just now you know I mean <laughs> It's very simple around the basic income grant. You need to say, uh, government has we had a hotla, we had a bus, we have had a ANC NEC hotla and a cabinet hotla, and there we've resolved that we'll have a basic income grant. A basic income grant would be between. 600 rand and a thousand or a thousand five hundred rand per month 
uh, the Minister of uh, uh, Finance, they hard it. When he delivers his budget speech, he will announce uh, the exact amount of what we will be uh, providing as a basic income grant. So he would be, he, he must be specific. At, the, at this thing, he would say, South Africa is going to introduce a basic income grant by within the next financial year or, or, or six months from here, and the Minister of Finance is going to announce the date uh, and, and, and the quantum. As simple as that, that is action. Not, uh, not that we're still working, there's going to be another committee. Because, I mean, this is a president that, that likes to to appoint committees and commissions to investigate things. And once they come with recommendations, he kicks it for touch. And it takes forever to implement those, those things. So that is what I mean when I talk about action, specifically around the issue that Dominic now has mentioned around the basic income grant. Now, all of you, I mean, will be marching on Parliament tomorrow. You'll be handing whatever memorandum yes. um, contains, uh, will be co that, that'll be containing um, your list of, uh, of, of demands. Now, how do we avoid making this a ritual, um, Dominic, every, you know, ahead yes. of every State of the Nation address? In other words, uh, when do you get to follow up on the issues that you will have tabled before Parliament, or, or I mean, tomorrow? Uh, what becomes the program of action of uh, these civil society organizations to make sure that you put the pressure you know on the people who have to make things happen thanks Will. first you want to say that we know where the money can be found so one example is the top one percent of wealth owners in this country if you put a small tax on them or between three and seven percent you raise more than 140 billion rand each year and the and 30 percent of the top wealth owners will have ev evaded paying that tax altogether. This is but one example. If we roll back the declining effective personal income tax rates on high income earners to around the 2005 levels, that's an additional 160 billion rand each year. This is not to even talk about stopping profit shifting and wage evasion, which we've spoken about many times before, which big corporations are shifting money out of the country to avoid paying their fair share in taxes and wages. More than 300 billion rand is shifted out of the country. Then there's the government employees pension fund, 2.3 trillion rand in accumulated reserves. Okay. We think that can, so there's a lot of possibilities in terms of where the money can be found. Number well, two, yesterday at the SABC in Pretoria, we actually had a protest and a launch where we said to you and others, although you didn't come, unfortunately, but many others did, ENCA, Newsroom Africa, etc. you can go and look. And what we said was, we are launching a year of mass action. And this is not just on big events. Mm -hmm. This is in the areas of the forgotten towns of the country, Bochabello, Makanda, Pebeja, etc., etc. We were saying, this government has forgotten about the majority of people in this country. This government okay. has turned its back on the poor in favor of the rich. And enough is enough. Okay. Dominic, I'm going to ask both of you with Rod, uh, but let's leave it there for today. We'll be monitoring the events uh, tomorrow. And as you know, I mean, you haven't, I mean, you've, you've, you've been on the program uh, several other times. We interrogate these issues on a daily basis. And I didn't have to come and uh, accept your memorandum or attend that function yesterday to be able to um, get these issues interrogated in the public space. But thank you very much for coming coming through um, tonight. We'll be monitoring the events tomorrow and, of course, uh, beyond. Um, Rod Solomon's convener of SA First Forum and, uh, of course, uh, Dominic Brown from the cry of uh, the excluded um, forum. Now, we're going to take a quick ad break and after the break we will talk about um, the expectations from some of the parties uh, represented in parliament as, um, as well as some of our struggle veterans as well as prominent personalities in the public space. That's coming up in a moment, don't go away.
There's more than one way to say, I love you. There's more than one way to say, I remember. Funeral cover from clientele means lasting dignity for you and your family. Our funeral plans are affordable. They pay within 24 hours. It includes a grocery and unveiling benefit. We will send you airtime when you claim. My husband's funeral plan paid for everything and we had money left for our living expenses. Funeral cover is affordable. Peace of mind is priceless. As a provider, you show your love in different ways, making financial provision as one of them. His death showed us that tomorrow is not promised to anyone. We should prepare for it today. You can now download our free funeral guide from our website. Try and tell funeral plans. It's your final gift of love. SMS honor to 48524 and we'll call you back. SMS now. To all women who are staying in an abusive relationship uh, because of that uh, proverb sake, a woman's grief is where she's married. I'm saying, please break the silence. Gender-based violence is very huge. A lot of women want to move out of their abusive and toxic relationships, but they cannot because they don't have the money to buy the expensive stands that the chiefs are charging them, and they do not have the money to also build houses. Breaking away from an abusive relationship is not easy, but it is doable. Let us support women who want to live. Families must embrace them and love them and help them to start a new life. Tomorrow night, uh, President, uh, economic observers say and ordinary citizens are eagerly awaiting the State of the Nation address. This is the country faces a number of serious challenges with persistent rolling blackouts top of mind. President Cyril Ramaphosa will be under pressure, uh, as everyone has been saying, to announce immediate solutions to the current energy crisis and other challenges like unemployment. SABC Senior Economics uh, uh, journalist Nombomelelo Siziba canvas the views of economists and labor around the expectations for SONA. Um, we also, all, of course, heard uh, today from various political parties um, who, uh, who have their own expectations of uh, tomorrow's State of uh, the Nation address. Brad Really, very few of them. Uh, in fact, only those from the governing party uh, seem to be optimistic about tomorrow's state of the nation address. Everyone else saying they will listen to what um, the president has to say. And of course, they will be making their views known and will be carrying their reactions live uh, before and after their state of the nation address. Look out for our rolling coverage from morning live uh, all the way uh, to the globe in uh, the evening. And that's where the SABC will be carrying the views of people across the political spectrum, business, labor, civil society, academics, everyone you can think of. So do tune in uh, from uh, tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. all the way to midnight. We'll be bringing you rolling coverage of tomorrow's State of the Nation address. But we're going to end here um, for now as uh, the watchdog on a separate matter, a double tragedy hitting the province of the Eastern Cape in the past 24 hours. One was a pile up on the N2 road between Kone and East London involving at least 13 cars. Unati Bimose is the spokesperson for the Eastern Cape MEC of Transport and Provincial Safety. The N2 between Ekon and East London is closed to traffic. That is due to a multi-car pileup involving about 12 cars. These cars collided partly due to a thick smoke. Evelakula tipu ya se PCM ilapa ga se Berlin. Amako se ndela ge alapo abonza gele iba badek selo spedlele. Inle li se da ukube ki valiwe de ukube kandi omisi lowo uyeesha. Tla se 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 se
Wede Umsi Weshe Oko Gugza Muktindela in a secondary accident and Octian Zek. Sakelagan Menomon and Dosa Wetu need to be limited to Amakos and Dela Lapo, Ogunibonis in Indel and Notinism. Kanikipa Glamanda was a comani, the corner flats of his case of Big Wampo, a pond along a panzer, Libega and Dilimans, the Dimtibilis, so Sitela extra vigilant, Guninong and Dosa Wetu. Well, from the uh, last briefing we got from uh, Unati Bingosa, whom you had uh, speaking there, um, no one, there were no fatalities um, between Bonne and uh, East London, even though eight people had been taken to hospital. Hopefully, the situation will stay like that. And with regard to the Gomani floods, the local government there telling us that uh, they are doing everything in their power to make sure that um citizens are protected but also there are those who need to be taken to places of safety are uh, indeed um uh, they they will enable uh, that as far as they possibly can our hearts and thoughts are with the people um, of that province who were involved in that accident on the n2 but also those who have been caught in floods in uh, Gomani. that's where we're going to leave it for tonight Thank you very much um, for watching, but uh, do join us from early tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. Our colleagues, Morning Live colleagues, will kick off our coverage uh, of Sona 2023 all the way to midnight. So do tune in and stay with the SABC for that uh, coverage of uh, the State of the Nation address, which will be delivered by the President at 7 p.m. tomorrow evening. Until we meet again tomorrow, do uh, stay tuned in and stay safe.